Hello, this is Smita Kumar and you're watching Medi Circle. Today on our healthcare startup series, we have Palami Chaudhary and Rohini with us. Palami Chaudhary and Rohini uh, Kalwakuntala is the, are the co-founders of Helix. Helix is a New York-based biotech startup that aims to enable safer gene editing, also providing a viable therapy to millions of people suffering from rare genetic disorders for which there is currently no cure. So hi, uh, Palami and hi, Ronin, Rohini. Welcome both of you to uh, Medi Circle Healthcare Startup Series. Thank you, Smita. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. So it's a, it's always a pleasure to host a woman entrepreneurs all out there. So more to women power, and so that there are more and more women who are watching this video and definitely take the plunge into startup if they are thinking and if they are already there in the segment and uh, they need some motivation. Do watch out this video for more such suggestions. So, uh, as the co-founders of Helix, Rohini and Polami, tell us more about your biotech startup, as it is definitely doing great in the genetic rare disease segment where there are there is no cure available. So, tell us about your journey and your startup. Sure, uh, I can go. Yeah. So, we are essentially <clears throat> reshaping the way gene editing is done today, right? Um, we are finding a way that can really lead to creation of safer and more reliable gene editing based therapies, uh, which can really provide hope for more than 300 million people who are suffering from some sort of genetic disorder across the world. So it's going to provide that promise and hope to these people for whom there is no cure currently available. So I think that's our vision and that's our motivation. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, uh, as Polomi said, gene editing is really a revolutionary uh, technology that has come about. For the first time, we are able to read our genome through sequencing and find areas, uh, you know, that are causing disease and to be able to edit it very specifically. But to take this amazing technology and make therapies out of it, what you know we have to be very careful we have to be very precise like what if we are editing in parts that you don't want to edit what we called as off targets right so what the uh, technology that uh, you know polymy is leading and we are building is to really how do you um, make that editing so so specific that it only edits exactly where you want so that we are able to come up with safe therapeutics and to provide cure for conditions like inherited blindnesses that you know kids suffer from uh, beta thalassemia sickle cell diseases different kinds of cancers so so much application for gene editing uh, that's what helix wants to do we want to accelerate the development of these therapeutics uh, sure. So, but uh, the way uh, people are getting affected with uh, these uh, genetic diseases, there are so many uh, common genetic disorders. So, uh, are you into only the com uh, I mean, only the rare sub segment, or also you're also treating common genetic disorders like Down syndrome or Fragile X syndrome or Triple X? So, we are starting with the rare uh, disorders, uh, of course, because in order to get to the bigger ones, you need to prove that you're able to do it for the rarest of the conditions. Uh, so, starting small and then expanding into the more common diseases. So, the potential is immense, right? Like today, we are talking about very rare disorders, but tomorrow, it can actually be applicable for things like diabetes or heart attacks. Things which maximum population is suffering with and is kind of continuously dosing themselves with insulin on a regular basis, you can actually do a once and done therapy for that. And then possibly once you correct the gene that actually causes diabetes, you don't ever have to go back to any kind of drugs or, uh, you know, hormonal injections and you're cured for life. So we are starting with rare conditions, but our vision really is to solve for any, any disorder that can be reversed genetically. Sure, Paul. Yeah. And uh, but as far as these rare genetic disorders are concerned, some of them being hemophilia, thalassemia, or sickle cell anemia, and also uh, primary immunodeficiency, especially in children like autoimmune diseases. Some of them being lysosomal storage disorders or POM disease. So, are you into these? Can you uh, kindly elaborate what uh, rare diseases, genetic rare disorders, are you dealing with? You are dealing with. 
Yeah, very uh, broadly, I think we're looking at uh, certain liver-based indications as well, like, you know, uh, what you've talked about, glycosomal storage diseases, etc. Uh, but also, we're very focused on the diseases of the eye, um, you know, diseases that cause blindness in kids, uh, you know, retinal disorders and other disorders. So uh, a lot of work is going on um, within these two areas currently. Yeah, sure. But as as we need to, uh, I mean, uh, make aware our audience also like about as the facts, as we, we talk about rare genetic diseases, it is estimated that globally around 6,000 to 8,000 rare uh, diseases exist. And uh, however, 80% of all these rare dis uh, diseases patients are affected by approximately 350 different kinds of rare diseases. So uh, genetically, uh, curing such rare diseases would be really something which uh, our startups uh, like uh, uh, Rohini's and Polomi Chaudhary's Helix is doing. So uh, tell, tell us uh, there are three waves of COVID-19 in two years. So has it impacted uh, your company or startup in any way? And yes, so how has it impacted? What were the challenges? Um, I, I, I'd love to start and then follow me uh, has to add it's it's very funny because we actually in, in fact started in the midst of COVID uh, you know I think what uh, happened is that the push uh, and the speed at which healthcare has progressed during COVID-19 is unprecedented. The amount, like the, the way the world came together and the companies came together to provide us with vaccines, the, the speed at which the entire ecosystem moved is very encouraging, especially for gene therapies, gene editing. Uh, you know, the mRNA technology that has come up, it has a significant role to play, uh, even in the space that we are in, where the regulators are looking at it. Uh, they have data, they have mechanisms to look at it. So I think uh, uh, while it was a very tough time that everybody faced in terms of like impending COVID and health situations from the, a startup and a business perspective, it wouldn't, it could not have been, uh, you know, come together at a better time where, uh, you know, the, the movement towards like pushing towards the unknown and making it happen is actually uh, very promising. I would actually add to that. So, uh, you know, the fastest vaccine development happened during this time. Nobody even knew much about, let's say, the term DNA. But after COVID, everyone's just been talking about RT-PCRs, mRNAs. Like, it's become these household names that everyone's using. And that was, like, hugely beneficial for us. Because now when we talk about gene editing, I mean, two years back, if you had spoken to people about genes and you're talking about, you know, reversing genetics, they would just give you a look that we don't understand what is this language that you're speaking. But right now, it's much easier, you know, we can talk to our friends and family and they understand, oh, you're trying to manipulate a gene. All right. So, you know, is it something to do with uh, the mRNA of the gene? And it's, we're in a much better place. And also, I think, you know, COVID was the time when we, we did a lot of brainstorming. Uh, so it was also a time which, you know, we could just cut off from all the distractions, sit down together and really put in our thoughts in building Helix. And I think, you know, th that was one of the most fruitful time that we had as a company, I believe. Definitely. Uh, as far as uh, biotech startups are concerned, uh, Rohini and Polomi, India, I would like to state some facts here. Like according to one IBEF report, India is among the top 12 destinations for biotechnology worldwide. And this industry comprises of approximately 5,000 biotech companies today, with 4,240 being startups and 760 being I mean, big crop biotech, biotech companies. And this number is going to be expected to touch 10,000 uh, by 2024. So India is definitely, uh, I mean, it's improving and improvising, and especially in the biotech segment, with leaps and bounds, having so many startups working on uh, such conditions, especially including rare genetic diseases. Uh, tell us how many lives you have touched so far, because uh, there are other people, other startups also, also working in the same segment. And any specific, uh, uh, AMA, any specific USP which you have aimed that you would be taking care of during your journey. Yeah, um, so th th that's phenomenal. And like you said, the rare genetic conditions affect about 300 mil million people 
people worldwide right and within that we have selected a few conditions we're continuously working on it with an aim to touch at least a million to million and a half lives directly through the conditions that uh, you know we are working on but hopefully um, as we go forward and gene editing becomes more um, you know common place in that sense then we partner for larger indications like uh, you know gen- uh, diabetes like cardiovascular conditions other metabolic conditions then you're really looking at you know tens of uh, millions of people uh, across the world that you can really touch um, but definitely we're in a phase where gene editing uh, we're yet to look at an approved therapy in market and that will hopefully happen um, over the next couple of years and that will be a huge momentum uh, for all of companies like us to like take more and more therapies to market so in the period of the next you know sort of 3 to 5 years uh, we're hoping to have um, you know some of our early uh, clinical trials in place where we start to change people's lives just to add to that as well as when he was talking about the space really growing there are like really 185 you know gene editing based therapies which are stuck at the regulatory approval and one of the biggest challenges is the safety associated with it and one of the biggest usps that helix is promising is to make sure that these therapies are assessed for safety we are making safer therapies and also increasing the reliability of bringing these therapies to market and you know some of the unique ways that we are doing it is going to be world changing it's actually going to revolutionize the way gene editing is going to be done today and in future uh, uh i would like to ask you one thing or uh, uh, both both the four founders that as it is see the number of uh, people suffering from uh, these rare disorders are pro- approximately i think approximately 400 million uh, around the world with 80% of them being of the genetic origin if we uh, talk about the uh, rare disorders that people have uh, but uh, there are there are a lot of regulations also required while you are uh, I mean, uh, me working on this. I think genetic uh, uh, rare disorders needs to be like there is one guideline that uh, uh, gene editing was uh, is it legal in India or not? Because uh, there were some things which were banned by the national guidelines from stem cell research. So, would you like to highlight something from that? uh yeah that's actually a great question um and there's two aspects of gene editing right there's the somatic and then there's the germline uh right what is acceptable and where the risk and reward is really really high is basically somatic gene editing something that's not passed on from one generation to other generation yet because we do not understand the full consequence of what what that will be and what that will happen uh, however actually india is taking a pretty uh, important role uh, in creating guidelines for gene editing um, you know with keeping in mind the off targets uh, but of course in the us and uk uh, with the fda and mhra what we have seen is that you know there are already gene editing in the clinic about 200 people have been dosed with some form of gene editing editing or the other uh, across the world uh, really and we've been able to see some outcomes as well so everywhere in the world right now is uh, somatic cell editing basically wherein and, and not germline and that's the main distinction that we need to make and india is making a lot of strides in terms of um, you know really forming the guidelines on gene editing and how do we encourage because We, we this is the only cure and hope that we have for the rare genetic conditions that we're talking about that don't even have uh, enough management there's there, it's just the quality of life and the disease burden is so high that the risk to reward is also very yeah. high to something like gene editing which is why the focus on rarer diseases right now before we move into more mainstream where there are other you know curative options currently alternative therapies yes, definitely um so uh, uh, Let, let's see how big is this market uh, so definitely it could decide that how easily you can get an investment uh, the global uh, biotechnology market size was estimated at uh, 1023 billion dollars in 2021 and is expected to grow at a, a cagr of 30.9% from 2022 to 2030 now this growing presence of personalized medicine and an increasing number of orphan drug formulations are opening up new avenues for biotechnology applications and also driving the influx of emerging and innovative technologies by technologies companies which is actually driving the market revenue even further so there are lot lot many investors people who are uh, willing to invest into these new changing disruptive technologies 
uh, how has been the journey i think uh, you both co founders can tell when you have been ex- i mean uh, uh, approaching the investors is your company bootstrapped or have you raised some funds no we are, we are we were actually part of indie bio so this is a us based accelerator it's one of the world's largest biotech accelerators so we got our initial funding uh, from indie bio and then we were also supported by sosv uh, genesis consortium and few of the other angel investors uh, you know based out of us and uk yeah so definitely we've raised a pretty good kickstarted pre seed round uh, that helps us you know achieve some of our initial milestones and move towards the seed round so we've been uh, very very uh, you know privileged like that with all the support that we got so far that's that's great to know so but as you're operating from new york your target geography is your ex- next future expansion uh, plans are is stopped out of india or uh, anywhere else in the world Oh, so we're a hybrid company. We're based both out of New York, but uh, our labs are also based out of Hyderabad. Uh, love the biotech ecosystem growth. We're based out of Pionest uh, in Hyderabad right now. Um, so yeah, uh, really, I think it's it it'll be a combination. I think we have amazing talent and technology. It's just that uh, you know the the movement in gene editing is faster in uh, you know sort of the US UK, uh, but we're catching up in India soon. So I think. uh you know will create a win win situation because as we go forward uh, manufacturing uh, regulatory becomes a huge step and i think we can really take advantage of what is there in india with respect to that you know we we are very very um, uh, you know big in terms of small molecules pharma development etc and we think that mm-hmm. even for gene therapies and gene editing india will become one of the leading countries uh, for that and we want to be pioneering that uh, but so a hybrid presence for us makes more sense right now great great yeah i, I hope polavi would like to add something no 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 i just i was just going to say that you know i you know we are starting in the us like the market is there but our, our ultimate goal is also to get it to india right so it's it's not just about making gene editing therapies it is also about making them accessible to people and the approach that we are taking we are making sure that gene editing therapies come to market quicker which means that you're reducing the amount of a revenue that you have to put in in order to develop a particular therapy which means the cost should eventually go down and that is the ultimate vision right we want it to be accessible to these 300 million people we don't want to be just making a therapy which sits there and is catering to 10 people who can afford it it is really about making it accessible and one of the biggest markets that we want to touch with respect to that is india because the genetic burden is so high in our country so it is important that we touch the lives of these people too so the ultimate market and the ultimate goal would always be india uh, you know of course but i think as rohini said the us and uk market is more ready in terms of the guidelines and regulations there and of course india is going to get there but today it is more ready there yeah but i would like to add it here that even india is uh, uh, doing lot of reforms and uh, trying to ease the gene editing yeah. regulations like the indian ministry of environment forest and climate change has decided to exempt products uh, derived through two gene editing techniques site directed nucleus stn1 and stn2 also uh, would like to go back little like uh, when was it was first actually the uh, targeted genetic changes were produced in the in yeast and mice in the 1970s and 1980s however this discovery of crispr uh, cr cs9 uh, genetic disorders that it would be a more sharper and economical gene editing tool so how how it, it proved to be a game changer would like to hear from both of us both of you sure um Uh, so absolutely i think gene editing has been around right and and uh, polymy will elucidate we've had many tools like uh, zinc you know zfn stalens uh, crispr cas and of course we know that you know uh, dr emmanuel charpentier and dr jennifer doudna won the nobel uh, prize for that is um, really the fidelity of editing as well as the 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 specificity of the cleavage the meaning that wow we're able to edit exactly at the point that we want to edit in a clean manner has enabled it to be used in a much more substantial fashion like for the first time we are able to think that wow can we actually put this in therapeutics can we put this in diagnostics much beyond just like laboratory usages or not just in plants and uh, you know this thing but can we actually use it in human beings and i think that 
cleanliness of editing uh, what we may call uh, and as they say it has also has been revolutionary yet from there it's a huge uh, you know milestone because even though we're able to edit it cleanly uh, and uh, you know um, in a very safe fashion i think we still have to consider how does it behave inside a human body because it's not the same as how it would behave um in in cell lines right and in an laboratory and in a very nicely uh, enclosed and controlled space and environment and i think that's where addition to the crispr cas technology and other newer uh, gene editing technologies uh, for making them more precise and safe is critical and that's um, that's the effort with helix but that's the effort that the community overall has to make to make this a reality and it's at the end of the day it's only 10 years old since it has come out and i think we we have made significant progress to get it to clinic uh, in such a short period of time uh, you know and we're only getting better and better at it yeah i would just like to add that you know it all started with gene therapies right where you're trying to replace an entire bulky gene and of course the feasibility is tough because you have to change the entire gene in order to make a change and not all genes are really small to kind of put in in a vehicle and put in your body and then came these bulky tools as really was mentioning the zinc finger nucleases talons the biggest challenge with them were of course they were bulky and not precise like they had a lot of off target effects uh, and then came crispr cas9 and the two most important things associated with it is the ease with which you can do crispr so you believe it or not you actually get these kits in us on amazon where you can do small crispr experiments at home where you can actually do gene editing on like you know prob- probably yeast cells and things like that it's that easy and the precision with which you can do that you don't have to really change an entire gene you are able to just go exactly in your gene it's just one letter that is changed and you are able to do that using crispr and with, with the ease that you can't imagine and it's possible to do that within the body because there are vehicles which can carry these not so heavy uh, uh, you know the apparatus that is required so i think in that sense it has really changed and evolved and of course because right now you can see 10 years it's been but you know for human therapies and things like that it's already been tested in the clinic so it has really come a long way for a revolutionary technology which is so new but has so much of potential uh, and but of course we have to be very sure because we are trying to put in a foreign object inside a human body we have to assess the safety aspects of it and i think we as helix like we put in a lot of efforts in understanding and making sure that it is safe and it can be translated so our efforts are really to accelerate you know the these therapies uh, to clinic as soon as possible as it's a decade uh, old uh, journey so tell us uh, some learnings which you would like to share with uh, the fellow entrepreneurs who are watching this video interview today so i think you have to have a vision and you have to be extremely passionate about it right uh, startups are difficult biotech startups are very difficult if you really really have to see the you know bigger picture because it takes time to achieve what you want to achieve So you have to be immensely passionate to kind of get up every day. Be so passionate about it that it will work. It will work, and it will work tomorrow for sure. So that passion is something that should be there. And the other thing is, you really need to dream big, right? We always start. We always restrict ourselves to thinking small. That oh, maybe I won't be able to achieve this. But you really need to think big if you want to get to ninety percent of your vision. So I think thinking big is something that I would encourage all the young entrepreneurs. um one big takeaway for me especially uh, you know as we go through this uh, all of us are co-founders we've known each other for such a long time at least polymy and i have known each other for over a decade now um i think a build it with the people that you trust and build it with the people that you know you know that even through the difficult times you have the ability to say i know why we came together and because believe me 90 out of 100 times it's going to be hard then it's going to be good but those 10 moments when it's good is worth it right and our other advisor actually so amazingly told is that as it takes a village to raise a child it takes a a village and a community to bring a therapy forward um at, le- at least for biotech it's not just we're all standing on the shoulders of giants people who have done such incredible work and we're standing on that to take it further forward right um so i think that helps us be really humble but that also helps us like take help and collaborate as much as we can uh, for something so unique and innovative to come out so i think it's it's that like it's not a zero sum game at least here not in biotech for sure it's it's more of a collaborative game and it's collectively moving forward 
just a quick question to both of you co-founders so many a times people doubt uh, multiple co-founders and is it uh, is single co single founders on uh, startups if you compare single founder startups but if you have co-founders who are expert in their own field so how you both are complementing each other and do you have fights <laughs> No, I think I think I I totally believe that this wouldn't have worked if Rohini was not with me, right? I think we bring in complementary skills, and we're always there to back each other up. And when you're alone and you're like you know fighting against all the odds, it becomes extremely difficult. So while I'm fire fighting on certain things, she takes care of the entire you know the other aspect altogether. So I have that confidence that if I am not able to do something in this much of time, I know Rohini is going to take over. and I, i don't understand why investors should not have confidence in multiple co-founders they should have even more confidence in multiple co-founders because now it's been distributed between them and they're going to be more efficient so to me i don't think helix would have happened if roini was not with me absolutely no i mean um, there's no way we would do it alone <laughs> and i think uh, it's also trusting and not overstepping right like see yes. uh, polo leads science and we have implicit trust and faith that you know she thinks and she feels it every single day and she's so passionate that all of that translates into therapies right and my goal here is to make sure that we make a business out of it in a way that we're constantly funded uh, in a way that you know we have everything that we need to keep going so um when when that happens but you know we talk about it together it's synergistic it's not like you know so we know where to take it and of course we all have disagreements right and disagreements are very very healthy in fact because um, you know th that's a learning and that's growth but i think that's also like when we have team we already have eight people in our team uh, right now and we're constantly growing so we're bound to create i think our vision is also how do we create an environment where people feel uh, both, both the connection to the sense of purpose as well as the autonomy for them to grow i think because we're working with phd's and post docs and like you know people that are highly skilled for us the way we do it is because we are all motivated to get something happen right and i think it's a very different style of a culture that we're trying to create here at helix great great so it was uh, it was really nice connecting with both of you uh, today at the setke startup series as we see there are lot of uh, benefits and these new biotechnology startups which are actually working in the rare uh, dis uh, genetic disease disorders because it is just not it's it's giving including these uh, it's actually helping the patients with faster and more accurate diagnosis also with uh, more targeted treatments that is one thing and also prevention of genetic diseases so it's 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 really good that uh, we have a uh, uh, indian based or uh, startups who are actually uh, running fighting against this rare genetic diseases hope we can definitely get solutions for all the other chronic diseases also thank you so much uh, rohini and polami uh, for joining us today at medicine thank you so much it was an absolute pleasure thank you yeah